Cool. So we've got some more people joined. So hello to everyone else. Uh, my name is Katie Strang and I'm Secretary and Trustee of the Scottish Geology Trust and welcome to our event this evening. I'm really looking forward to this one. We've got Clive Mitchell from the British Geological Survey to speak to us about his book on pebble spotting. So I'm going to pass you over now to Clive and I'll let him sort of introduce himself and I'm looking forward to a great talk. Great stuff. Uh, thanks very much, Katie. Let me just let me just share my presentation, and hopefully, uh, can you have, can, can oh here we go. Let me just share it. Actually, physically share it. Share. Hopefully now, Katie, that you can see that. You can see, you've got it. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. All good. Okay. Cool. Let me just let me just drag this across here. I can actually see what I'm doing. Okay, cool, excellent. Oh, hang on, let's get rid of that bit. Oh, that's better. Okay, everyone. Sorry for that bit of messing around. Um, yes, as Katie said, hi, everyone. Um, my name's Clive Mitchell. Uh, I am the author of The Pebble Spotter's Guide. So it's a shame I can't be with you because if you've got a copy, I could have signed it. But hopefully, in the next time we, we, we meet, we, we, I can sign a copy for you. Well, I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm a geologist and I work for the British Geological Survey. Um, I'm an industrial mineral geologist. I've been there for a long time. I've been at the BGS for 32 years. And most of my work, in fact, I'll just, I'll just sort of like advance the, the slides, hopefully. Has that advanced the slide, Katie? It hasn't, has it? No. For some reason, that's not advancing. Ah, there we go. Is that better? You can see the second one. Okay, cool. <laughs> you all know what a beach is. <laughs> this is the Hornsey in Yorkshire, and this is one of my, uh, my, my targets for when I was collecting pebbles uh, for the book. Uh, basically, um, when we came to the lockdown last year, I sat down with a whole bunch of pebbles and worked my way through them and realised I needed some more. And I thought, well, I'd better get up to the beach then. And from where I live in Nottingham, uh, we're a long way from the sea, at least a couple of hours, and... I usually go to the Lincolnshire coast or the Norfolk coast. I thought, no, I'm going to go somewhere a little bit better. So, and so I, I found Hornsey in Yorkshire. And what a great location. Sandy beach with a few pebbles. Perfect. Just like how I like it. Um, next slide. So just to give you a potted history of who I am, as I said, I work for the BGS, the British Geological Survey, and have done for quite a long time. I'm what they call a charter geologist. So uh, that means I'm long in the tooth. I've got lots of experience. I've been very lucky in my career to work up in a lot of different places. And as you can see, I've worked in Afghanistan, the Middle East and Thailand. Katie, it's still advancing, yeah? We're still on? Yeah, okay, cool. And you can see the sort of thing that I see, this sort of middle point here. I'm, I'm a geologist who works out what things are useful for. So if we have a piece of limestone, I can do an analysis and an assessment. I usually collect the material as well. And then I, and I can write a report and just say yes or no, this stuff is good for cement or, or whatever else limestone applications. You, you, know, you even find limestone, crushed limestone, calcium carbonate in toothpaste. Um, and there's a whole bunch of minerals here. And th this is what I normally do in my day job. I'm looking at all sorts of different industrial minerals, as we call them, and working out what they're good for. And in the last couple of years, well, before the lockdown anyway, I've sort of expanded into things like small scale mining and also I'm currently part of a team looking at resources for for battery raw materials. So we talk about uh, lithium iron or rechargeable batteries, batteries that you might find in smartphones or, or batteries for energy storage. And they use elements like lithium and cobalt and graphite and graphite is something that I look at. So that's just a snapshot just to show you who I am. and. How and why am I talking about pebbles? Well, <laughs> this was me when I was a little boy, when I was probably about five-ish or so. And typically, I, I, I grew up in the West Country, in, in, in what is now North Somerset, midway between uh, Western Supermare and Bristol. And back in the, this would have been back in the 60s, we'd head on down the road down to Cornwall, and we'd be camping in Cornwall, and I'd spend my time on the beaches. So I first started collecting pebbles when I was a kid. And obviously, I didn't really have a clue what they were. I just liked pebbles for the tactile feeling. And I was a little boy and, you know, little boys always have pebbles in their pockets. I mean, that's the rule. Um, there you go. 
And that was over 50 years ago. And it's getting beyond 50 now. And if you scroll forward uh, a few years, um, back in 2016, I was working in the communications department for the British Logical Survey. So I was doing all sorts of, of, of news articles and stories and hooking up scientists with journalists and about earthquakes and fracking and all sorts of things going on uh, with the BGS. And Paula Kokoza, a journalist from The Guardian, contacted me. And she said, I've just come back up on a holiday and we had a great time looking at pebbles. I'd like to write an article about pebbles. And I just thought, actually, this is what I could do. So I arranged to meet Paula. Uh, and she said, we want to meet somewhere not a million miles from London where she was based. And I thought, well, if I draw a circle around London and a circle around Nottingham, where are you going to meet? And it's going to be in East Anglia. And I thought, OK, it's Cromer. So we headed to Cromer in December. Uh, it, it was a nice day, luckily. It, it was dry, it was cold, and it was a nice day for just walking on the beach. And you can imagine the scene. Um, you're on the beach and you're just looking down and picking up pebbles. And Paula's picking up pebbles, which she just likes the look of. But she doesn't know what they are. And this is where I came in. So I spent the day with, with, uh, with Paula Kokota and a, a photographer, and we basically just discussed what pebbles are, what they're made of, you know, the different types of rock. You have three basic types of rock. You have sedimentary rocks, igneous rocks, you have metamorphic rocks, and how they form to pebbles and, and why they end up on the beach. And then Paula wrote an article which then made its way into a special supplement of The Guardian, a double page spread, in February 2017. And it's, if, you, if you Google this, you'll find it. It's called No Stone Unturned, My Search for the Pebble Hunter's Holy Grail. So it's still online. And there's a quote there that allegedly I said, I assume this is on the telephone when I first spoke to her um, about doing the article, is pebble hunting is what geologists do on holiday. It's a bit of a busman's holiday situation. But you take a geologist in any, anywhere on the planet and there are rocks everywhere and that they're going to be going up to those rocks and um, Katie and other, other geologists will say exactly the same thing you can't take you can take the geologist out of the workplace but you can't take the geologist out of the geologist the geology out of the geologist you will go and you will look at rocks I mean my nickname in the family is the family rock stroker because if there's a stone building I will be up to it in a, in a flash touching the rock trying to work out whether it's limestone or sandstone or granite or whatever so that's, that's how I got involved. And then basically in 2017, I started collecting in earnest because I thought, oh, I've got the bug again. I really like pebbles. At this point, I, didn't, I knew nothing about the book. And this time, obviously as a professional geologist, I know what they are. Not like a five-year-old, I can work out what the pebbles are and the best way to collect them. And, and I quickly accrued because I, travel, I was traveling around quite a bit in the UK and making little detours to beaches in Yorkshire or wherever I was. And I have got lots of pebbles uh, in my office. And then out of the blue, the National Trust contacted me. It's a book, it's a company called Pavilion. Pavilion Books Group actually produced all the books for the National Trust. If you pick up a National Trust book and you look inside the inside cover, it will say an imprint of Pavilion Books Group. And I spoke to the, the commissioning editor and he said, we want to do a book on pebbles. And my pebble collection just so happened to be perfect for this. And when we went into lockdown in March 2020, I obviously took a lot of pebbles back home with me, back into this room here. This is the back bedroom in my home, my, my home in Nottingham. And I spent a long time just going through those pebbles, trying to whittle them down to 40 pebbles. I was trying to get as a greater variety of different types of rocks as possible just to populate this book. And the Pebble Spotter's Guide, if you're not aware, <laughs> was published on the 10th of June. And as I was saying to Katie earlier, it, I've been amazed at how well this, is, this has gone. Um, I didn't expect this to be so successful. I think they printed about 7,000 copies. They've sold 5,000 already. I have to hold my hand up. I'm a public sector scientist. All the royalties for the book go to the British Social Survey. So I get the kudos and the enjoyment of having written the book and doing this sort of thing for you lovely people, but I don't get any extra money for it. I'm, uh, so, but, you know, who knows in the future, maybe I'll, maybe I'll earn a fortune from it, who knows? So 
without further ado, let's talk about what is a pebble. Well, that's pretty obvious, isn't it? We all know what a pebble is. Well, there's lots of there's sort of definitions about what a pebble is, but my definition of a pebble, and it's a it's a it's my it's more of a romantic definition. It's not a scientific definition. It's basically a smooth rock that fits neatly in the palm of your hand. And here we go. Let's grab a pebble. Here we go. So here's my favourite pebble, and <laughs> this is a pebble that I picked up on the beach when I spoke to Paula Kakosa. And this is an igneous rock. I'll tell you about it a bit later. But it fits neatly in the palm of my hand. You can see, and it's quite nice and round and tactile. And that, for me, is the perfect shape. But also, it's got a bit of interest as well. It's got some nice large crystals. So that's quite a nice one. I mean, pebbles. A pebble. The, the actual the term pebble is what we describe more as a, a particle size term. So you you know you know sand and silt and clay. Well, they're not the type of material, it's the size of the particle. So sand is particles of a certain size, from two millimetres down to about 63 microns. Now, a micron is a thousandth of a millimetre. So you sand, that is can be made of anything. Silt is the next size down from 63 microns down to two microns, and then below two microns, it's clay. So sand, silt, clay, and we get rocks made of these things. We get mud, we get clay rocks or mudstone, we get siltstone, we get sandstone. Pebbles, the size range of pebbles technically can be four millimeters to 64 millimeters. There isn't such a thing as a pebble rock. There's a beach rock, but there's not a pebble rock. We would actually, a geologist would call a pebble rock a conglomerate. So a conglomerate is a rock made with pebbles in it, nice round pebbles in it. So if you see a conglomerate, this is a rock made of pebbles. Fantastic. And obviously pebbles on the beach can be made of lots of naturally occurring rocks, but when you go on the beach, they're not all naturally occurring. So you get things like glass and concrete, bricks and tarmac. And if you look at my book, you will see pebbles of those composition in my book. Now, to many people, me included, they're just as much a pebble as the sandstone, limestone, granite, etc. They're all pebbles to me. And I think, you know, sometimes even a geologist will confuse a little bit of concrete with a sandstone, or maybe vice versa. <laughs> they might confuse a sandstone for a bit of concrete. So it's a bit tricky. And even now, in the world of, 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 of marble and dimension stone for buildings, uh, companies are generating artificial materials which look just like granite for worktops or marble for worktops and they're composites. Very difficult for a geologist to really tell them apart, apart from the fact that they're usually too perfect. So where can I find pebbles? Well, obviously, <laughs> we've been talking about beaches, but we can find them in rivers, lakes, on the beach. We can also find them on land as well. So obviously, Pebbles start their life, they may, they may have started their life being eroded away from hills and mountains and then travel through rivers via lakes. You may get uh, pebbles occurring on lake shores, on be lake beaches. And then when that river gets to the sea, the pebbles are dumped on the beach, but also on land. Where I come from, I'm in the Midlands. And if I go into some of the parks and, and, the, and the forests around, around Nottinghamshire, there's a pebbly sandstone that underlies the ground and that pebbly sandstone is full of pebbles. The sandstone wears away so you get a sandy track with lots of pebbles in it. So you can get pebbles in forests and other areas as well, depending on the geology. So I mentioned how pebbles are made and not just uh, erosion, but they can be a mechanical, uh, mechan uh, mechanical and chemical weathering, which will break up big chunks of rock from mountains and hills. And ice, rain, heat, all of these things can act on rocks to break them up. Working, uh, acting on fractures, and then the difference in temperature between night and day, and lots of water and ice, and all of these things can break rocks up. And as they're washed down the streams, pebbles will go from being quite angular and sharp and jagged to more rounded. And the way that works is essentially is that the pebbles are rounded, they are bashed against each other. It's called self-abrasion. So you get two rock, you get two pebbles 
working their way down. They're continually knocking to each other. And what happens is that knocks off the sharp corners of the pebble. That's why pebbles are the shape they are, because they're knocking towards each other. The other interesting thing about pebbles is often they're not perfectly round, they're slightly flattened. That's a weird phenomenon, but I think it's the way basically they settle out. They don't, you don't get the situation where they are perfectly knocked together to make a round sphere. Perfectly round pebbles are pretty rare. Normally pebbles are fairly flattened or even very flattened. So why do some beaches have pebbles and not others? It's a good question. I know I wrote it. <laughs> uh, this is generally to do with the hardness of the geology and the rocks. So what the picture here is showing chalk cliffs and chalk is a very soft rock. Chalk will not survive being bashed around on a beach for very long. But you can see chalk pebbles in this picture because the chalk cliffs are right there. This chalk would normally get washed away and you, in, in other areas, you probably won't find many chalk pebbles because they are very soft. And that's the rule, the, the rule of thumb, basically. The things that generally have survived the transport or the traveling from the hills and mountains via the streams and lakes to get to the beach are the hardest things. And those things are really hard rocks, hard rocks like granite, hard minerals like quartz. And that will then sort of separate out the types of rocks that you might find on a beach and depends how far away they come from if they're local so you might have a sandstone which might be quite crumbly because sandstones can be quite crumbly they might have come from a local cliff but if they've come from a bit further away they'll just break right down to sand and obviously that's where the sand from the beach comes from from things like sandstone so it very much depends on the type of the hardest and also the geology some areas like chalk areas are very soft. Some areas may not have any hard rocks. They may just be soft materials, maybe sediments. There may be no, there may be no source of hard rock material in that area. So you won't get any pebbles, you'll just get sand. And then you'll get, you'll get material moved around the coast. And typically there's something called longshore drift, which moves material on the east coast, north to south, on the south coast, east to west, on the west coast, south to north sort of rotates its way around the country. You won't get a pebble working its way all the way around, around the country because there's lots of things in the way, like rivers and headlands that will then stack up those pebbles. But that's an interesting phenomenon that pebbles will generally work their way around sort of uh, clockwise around the country. So what would I do? How would you go about finding pebbles? <laughs> I, I think one thing to stress, um, it's worth checking and this is quite hard to do, and I'll come on to this. Are there any local laws about, or local bylaws about collecting material and pebbles on that beach? Are you allowed, legally allowed, to take material away from the beach? And I'll come back to this one. And when you get there, and this is more my mindfulness tip, is what I often find myself doing is pacing up and down the beach, head down, looking and scanning backs and forwards, usually because I'm in a hurry. But the best thing I found is to sit down in the pebbles and go through every single one. And it's amazing what you will find if you take the time to do that. Now, when I was a student, it's a sort of classic th the lecture thing the lecturer would get to do is to grid out a square on a beach and get you to try and identify every single rock usually because it was part of a study they were being paid for. Identify every single rock in that, in that square. That's a good discipline, and you can do a little bit of a sort of, sort of, almost a sort of scientific study in the number of proportions of different types of rocks. But it's interesting what you'll see when you, when you do this, if you sit down. Um, you will actually discover some rocks will, will, they will sort of stratify, <clears throat> a little bit like the way you've got um, some cereal. You know, you might have some fruit and fiber, say for example, in a box. And what will happen is, if you shake that box up, all the big flaky stuff comes to the top, and all the sort of small, heavier things like the currents will sink to the bottom. You could argue that is a similar way to what happens on a beach, that you get an, an element of stratification. Counterintuitively, the big stuff comes to the top. It's more because the little stuff slips between the cracks of the big stuff. So you'll often find the small stuff underneath and the small stuff might be different type of rock than the big stuff. 
So it's well worth just sitting down and sort of peeling off the layers of rock because you might discover some really interesting pebbles underneath that layer. So that's a really top tip, I think. And obviously, you know, taking pictures, I always take pictures. It's, I, I found it quite difficult to take pictures. And I, I've got some photos of some of the pebbles that I found. It is really hard to take a picture of a piece of rock. Um, I get sent pictures all the time uh, on Twitter and Facebook and other things to uh, try and identify rocks. It is very hard to get them in, well lit, in focus, and just looking like the piece of rock in your hand <laughs> and showing up all the individual minerals and crystals that you're looking at. So it's, that's quite hard. So if you've got a good, got a good camera or you've got, you, you've, got a, you've, you've got a good knack for taking photos, great stuff. The other good thing about a smartphone is it will, have, it will have a location attached to the, the image data on your photo. So it's really useful for ge what we call geolocating that image. So if you use, um, there are various apps that you can locate photos. We have an app called iGeology and you can upload your photo to this, to this app. It will automatically locate your image based on the location data from your photo if taken on a smartphone. But really interesting and I'll show you some pictures from my geology. So tips on collecting folk, tips on collecting. Um, hand lens. <laughs> now this is a pretty basic geologist tool. This is a hand lens and we're looking at, uh, it's basically like a magnifying glass and you're looking at something in the region of times 10 to times 20 magnification. And top tip for using hand lens it's not like using a magnifying glass. You know, with a magnifying glass, you sort of generally do this. So, oh, yes, yeah, very interesting, Sherlock. Uh, whereas with a hand lens, if you take my glasses off and get a pebble, the best way to use a hand lens is you bring the, ha the hand lens right up to your eye. So it's literally touching your eyelashes and then bring the rock up. Now, the good thing about this, the good thing about this, this hand lens it's got a built-in light. <laughs> this is my top tip for the gloomy UK, which means I can see what's going on. Now, if you do this, bring it, bring this right up here and you bring your rock up here. Ooh, look at that. It's the wow factor, the ooh factor. And I show kids how to use a hand lens. It's always, ooh, look at that. And I can see all the individual minerals and crystals really clearly. Let me just get my, retrieve my glasses. There you are. <laughs> So you can get these on the internet. They're not that expensive, uh, but but a hand lens is important for really working out what what the what the rock is, what's going on in the rock. And like I say here, sometimes if you wet the rock, it's easier to see what's going on. Reference books. I've got some great books for you. Um, not just my pebble book, but there are all sorts of other books, and, I'll, and I've got a few slides on those, so I'll show you those. And I I'm a professional geologist. I have to use reference books. Everyone, all scientists use reference books. You know, we, we, we're not we don't we're not computers. We 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 do need the help of guides and and, and reference books. And um, if you're going anywhere, uh, I always in my little rucksack I've got a, some bags. And what I tend to use, what I found really good, are these little food bags. And I've 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 been using these for years. These little little Ziploc bags are fantastic. And it keeps the rocks really fresh. <laughs> fresh, in the, fresh in the sense that it's not good to eat, but fresh in the sense that it's not been bashed or it's dusty. Because if you have a bag of rocks together, what happens is that bashing together will continue and you'll end up with a bag of very dusty rocks. So you don't want that. So, um, and sometimes I use a bit of bubble wrap or whatever. I mean, my collect, these, these rocks are the ones that are from the books. So I'm, I'm protecting these very carefully. I wrap them up. And also um, you can write on the bag where you got it from. What I generally write, I might put Hornsey, Yorkshire and the date and maybe what the rock is if I've identified it. What I also do is write it on a slip of paper and put that in the bag with the pebble. Because if you write on the bag and it rubs off, which can happen and does happen, happens a lot. Um, as a professional geologist, that's extremely embarrassing. If you get back uh, to your base and you've got a lot of bags and all the, all the writings rubbed off, you don't know what the rocks or where they're from. 
So it's always a good idea to do that. So that's a sort of bit of professional advice, basically. Um, geological hammers. Where's my hammer? All geologists have, have a hammer. This is called an S-wing geological hammer. It's got a pick end. I generally tend to use a very small hammer. I'm not really into hammers particularly. <laughs> I'm a geologist. You've got to have one. But really what I would say is this is for the advanced federal enthusiasts. Um, and it can reveal, so for example, I follow a guy on, on, on Twitter, he's down in Charmouth, he's a guide, he's always cracking open little lumps of limestone and revealing amazing fossils. Fantastic, I want to do that. <laughs> I know what happen is I'll probably hit my thumb, but um, you might reveal uh, a geode, for example, you might uh, split open the pebble and you might discover really amazing fossils which are, or, or minerals which have grown into the cavity within that rock. And that's that's possible. Um, to be honest, I, I'm I'm a bit wary because you know health and safety. You've got to wear goggles and gloves, and you've got to watch out for people. And also, whatever you do, if you've got a hammer, do not hammer into cliffs. Um, cliffs are dangerous enough as they are um, with cliff falls and rock falls. If you hammer into a rock face, the vibrations that you set up the rock face may trigger. A rock fall quite seriously. So I would strongly advise you not to do that. Always go for material which has fallen off the cliff and get away from the cliff. Uh, cliffs are not great places to be around. So that which neatly brings me on to safety, safety on the beach. So as I said, stay away from cliffs, especially, well, not just wet weather, because what happens when it rains, the cliffs soak up the water, they become really heavy, and all that weight then presses and opens up fractures. The same can happen in dry weather. The, the, weather, the rocks get really dried out and those fractures open up again. Follow any warning signs like this one. Um, they're there for a reason. Tide times, and I'm being ca caught out by the tide times, and it is possible to, to be cut off. It's happened to me, nearly happened to me. Um, and you get some beaches which are very steep, so watch out because you can get knocked over by waves. And as I said, don't, don't hammer into cliffs um, and wear, wear eye protection. So I mentioned this earlier um, about collecting pebbles. And is it illegal to collect pebbles from a beach? Well, you have possibly seen articles online that have told you in no uncertain terms it is illegal to collect pebbles from the beach. It's very clear in the law it's illegal. Well. It's not quite as clear as they make out in the articles and online. There is something called the 1949 Coastal Protection Act, which does have a provision for coastal protection authorities to create a local by law pro prohibiting the collection of excavation of material, okay, from a specific beach or stretch of coastline. You can get a license from that authority if you want to. I, I can't imagine because the principle goes. Um, you want to protect uh, the coastline. You want to minimise the amount of erosion and taking pebbles from a beach causes erosion. In certain beaches, a lot of erosion because they might be highly attractive pebbles that people might want to use for, hard, for landscaping in their garden or whatever. People take away boot falls and, and bags falls and I don't really condone that. I think a few pebbles, fine. There is a provision for that. However, the provision in this act only comes into effect when the, that Coast Protection Authority applies to, to make that act into, into a local bylaw. This is not a blanket provision. If you read the articles online, the implication is that it's illegal everywhere. That is not true. That is wrong. It's only illegal where the act has been, this provision in this act has been uh, created and it has to be signed off by a minister of state. So you're seeing certain places where this is the case. And there are famous beaches in the UK, Budley Solston, famous beach, Chesil Beach, another famous one, Crackington Haven, where there was a well-known case where a, a visitor was forced to drive a long way back to the beach. I suspect he probably took a lot of pebbles. Uh, to, to, and these are well-documented examples there won't be many people that have actually got the truth on this. And there are usually signs 
So like I said earlier, uh, check the bylaws. Well, if, there, if there's a bylaw, there will be a sign. If someone has gone to the trouble of enacting a provision of the, of the 1949 Coast Protection Act, there will be a warning sign on that beach advising you not to collect pebbles. If there's no sign, it's reasonable to assume that it's safe to go ahead and collect a few pebbles. So I say, in most cases and most beaches in the UK, it's fine. It's not illegal. It can be illegal only if this act has been enacted. So I think I'm on hiding to nothing trying to dispel all those articles out there. But whenever I do a talk, I'm just going to make it very clear that there is this is the case. OK. So and here are the sorts of signs that you might see um, on beaches. Um, pretty clear. Um, and I, reckon, I, I promised you a few books as well. Now, the most famous book on pebbles is The Pebbles on the Beach by Clarence Ellis, which was published in 1953. This is my copy. It's not the same as that one there, because the one on the screen was reprinted in 2018. And it, it's, it's a really good book. It's, it's written in a 1950s style, so it's quite long winded. But if you're really interested in learning about pebbles, the formation of pebbles, the longshore drifting I told you about, all of those sorts of facts about pebbles are in here, including a lot of information about different beaches in England and Wales. I'm not sure why he didn't go to Scotland, but there you go. <laughs> but if you, I've read the entire thing, and it, it, to be honest, I, I enjoyed it. It was, it was a little bit like homework. But I, I did enjoy reading it and I would recommend this if you are genuinely interested and you can pick up copies of this if you go online. The, 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 the 2018 version has got a nice cover. It's the same words, obviously. Um, the other book here is this one. This one here. This was really lovely. The Book of Pebbles. And this is less scientific and more just really nice stories and romance about pebbles really i sat down one lunchtime to read it and i read the entire thing in about an hour and a half so it's not very long but it's fantastic artwork in the book and it's just a lovely book and i heartily recommend that i really love that book fantastic and this is where we get a little bit more serious <laughs> i'm a scientist after all and these are the sorts of things that if you really want to know about what the rocks are. This is the book to get. Fantastic. I got this from one of my favourite bookshops in Derbyshire, Scarfins. Fantastic. And really, as you'd imagine from Dorling Kindersley, this is really is the definitive guide. It's fantastic. I use this a lot. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, you'll often see pictures from this where I'm, I'm saying, I think it's this <laughs> from here. Which is a great book, really clear and, and fantastic. Um, the other book is this this book here, and this is really good for the sort of the classification of rocks. I'm really excellent. I've learned a lot from this book. So I'm a mineral geologist. So I, you know, this is this has been a fantastic book. So these two books together will really give you a fantastic grounding in in geology. So those four books together, I think, will be a really good sort of uh, addition to your sort of like uh, geological pebble hunting arsenal. And you can't obviously take all these books with you when you go anywhere. So if you do take one book with you, uh, and it's the smallest one, obviously, it's my one. <laughs> so you take that one with you when you go. Um, and I mentioned the app, um, something called iGeology, and it's a BGS app. It was on Android as well. I'm, I'm not sure why recently it's come off Android. I'll have to ask Mike, the developers. But it's definitely for Apple. If you've got an Apple iPhone, um, download this for sure. It's brilliant. And it's basically um, has all the maps, all the geological maps that the BGS have ever produced in, in an app. Um, what you do, you open the app up and you can click a button and it zooms to wherever you are and it will show you a geological map. You can click on the map. You can see here this middle one, for example, um, Fat Whiting Bay, that's on Aram. And one of the pebbles I collected, which I'll show you in a bit, was from here. And I, you know, I can click on this and it can tell you what the geology is. It doesn't necessarily always help with the pebble because the pebble might have come from somewhere else, but it's really nice. 
and it uses the GPS in your phone to locate you where you are. It does require a signal. So if you're in the middle of nowhere and there's no signal, it ain't going to work. But if you're in an area where there's a signal, it's going to be great. And it, it it's, gives you an option to learn more. And this will then tell you more about the, the geological details of the formation of the rocks that you're looking at, which is really interesting. It'll tell you about the types of rocks, it'll tell you about the age, and then it'll then give you options for more information on our website as well. And um, you can create an account. And I mentioned earlier about, about photos. Well, this app gives you an opportunity to upload your own photos, your geological photos of rocks and minerals onto the app. It will then locate your photo on the app. On, on the map and then uh, as, a, as a user you can then scroll through all the pictures of, of everyone that's loaded up at the minute it's probably mostly bgs geologists that have added photos but there's a lot of photos in there really really interesting it's a it's a great tool that's growing all the time <clears throat> okay so let me just take a drink of water are there any questions from anywhere anyway katie are there any questions from anyone <clears throat> So we have a couple that have come in so far. We have one from Kaz who asked that she thought the shape of pebbles were dependent on the molecular structure. That's a, a good, a good, um, a good question. And, and I suppose ultimately, if you talk about the composition, so the molecules in a pebble that, that, for, that form the minerals, the minerals are the ones that have the structure. So, for example, if you have a, a quartz that has a particular structure, calcite, another one, they all have different shapes. And if you break those minerals, they will break along planes of weakness, and that will control to some extent the shape. The way the rock is formed as well, will sometimes sedimentary rock is pressed into layers. Those layers may preferentially break into thin plates. You might get a flat, you might get a, a relatively flattish pebble like that. Other rocks are much more. Uh, compacted and strong, like say like an igneous rock, okay, looking for a piece of granite, they tend to be rounder because they're locked together, the, the minerals locked together. So yes, you're right, if you mean the composition of, of, the, of the pebble can influence the shape, yes. Thank you. Um, and another one was about the best strength of hand lens, but I think that actually got answered in the chat. Um, yeah, yeah. I'd say 10 to 20. Yeah, times 10 is pretty common. 20, but times 10 is probably the most common. Um, but yeah, great, good, good. My hand lens, fantastic. <laughs> and one more from Molly, um, who's going to Cromer Beach tomorrow. Ooh. And do we have any tips for the first pebble spotting trip? Oh, tips for the, her first pebble spotting trip. Oh, I see. Yes. So if this is your first ever trip to collect pebbles, then I would recommend that you um, you take some small bags with you and you take some some paper, which you can then write some little labels on and take a pen, uh, take a take a camera or a smartphone. Uh, if you've got a smartphone, if it's an iPhone, maybe download iGeology. Um, and then if you're lucky enough, if you've got a hand lens, if you get a hand lens, that will help you look at the rock. Um, but in terms of trying to work out what the rock is, um, I'm going to talk about some of these pebbles here now. This might give you a, th a few clues as to how to identify the rock, because sometimes it's, it's hard um, and I'll explain. If it's, a, if it's got a fossil in it, it's probably going to be limestone. If it feels rough and sandy, it's probably a sandstone. If it's got lots of lovely big crystals in it and it's sort of pinkish, it's probably a granite. <laughs> they have gross generalizations, but they're the sorts of things that would flip through my mind as a geologist when I'm looking at stuff on the beach. So good luck. And what I would say is if you're stuck, um, have a look on Facebook for the Pebble Spotters Facebook group, because you can always upload your images to there and we can have a go and I can help you identify what they are. Okay, Katie, cool. Any more questions? And there's one more from Jody saying, is there something to look out for when looking for fossil pebbles? Something to look out for when you're looking for fossil pebbles. Oh, you mean, are there any clues if there's a pebble, a fossil hidden in the rock? Hmm, that's a really good question. And I, th I think that if we, if we had the answer to that, we'd, be, we'd all be rolling in fossils. 
But I, what I would say is that generally you you want to find you want to find a, a limestone if you want a, a, a fossil, and it's generally limestones of sort of like grayish in color, and you want ones which are reasonably uh, hard. Um, you, you might find some softer limestones, but they tend to be crumbly. You know, you get you get um, some Jurassic limestones which fall apart as soon as you look at them. Other limestones which are a bit harder. If you if you pick up the pebbles, you might see some little marks on the side. That might be a clue as to whether there's actually something like an ammonite or a bivalve or other fossil in there. The only way to find out is to is to hit it open with a hammer. <laughs> and I would be very careful. This is where I would say that. Ideally, you want to find ones which are already uh, the fossils are already visible. Um, so there's no hard and fast way of really, I think, uh, or, or, it's, it's just look at lots of rocks. <laughs> yeah, I would say the same about fossils, and it's just sort of getting used to what the different shapes are of the types of fossils you're likely to find. So if you know the rough age of the rocks around that area, it makes it a wee bit easier to narrow down what you're actually looking for when you go out. It does help a lot. And I think we have some more questions as well. Cool, let's, go, let's do a few more because I've got, basically what I've got is a series of images of pebbles, but we do the questions and I can go through the pebbles. Cool, I'll do a couple more questions that have come in and then we can do some more questions after. Yeah, let's do that. A bit more. Um, so one from Andrea asking, are you allowed to collect pebbles from hills? Very good question. Um, it very much depends uh, if that hill is private land. Uh, if you've got permission from the landowner, then yes. Um, if it's a public space, if it's a if it's a park or it's uh, I don't know a, a forestry commission area or it's public pu a public right of way, then yes. Um, some public rights of way are through private land though. So um, if the pebbles, if you're only taking one or two. Um, that's fine, but I, I think it, in principle, the landowner really should give you permission, but if it's public space, then it's fine. So on a beach, for example, this is a public space. So, um, and, and some hills, but if you're, if you're walking in the middle of nowhere in Derbyshire or wherever you, wherever you like to walk and you find a rock, uh, I don't think there's a real problem if you just take one or two. Um, I don't think you're going to cause um, massive erosion by doing that. Really, I think it's when you get you get people collecting large volumes, and 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 also, I draw the line really um, where people collect things for sale, for commercial purposes. Um, that becomes a different ball game. It almost becomes like quarrying and mining then, uh, and you know you need you need to think about you know licenses etc. But you're not in that ball game. Hopefully, <laughs> uh, if it's just one or two. Generally, you're fine. Awesome, thank you. Um, now, what I'll do is I'll take a note of the other questions that have come in, but we'll come back to those after. So I'll let you continue. I'll carry on. Your okay. Awesome talk. So everyone can see this picture we've got here now of the Ron Porphyry on my screen. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to just talk you through a few of my pebbles, and uh, the, all of these came from my book. Uh, this is the one I showed you earlier that I said was my favourite pebble, and this came from Cromer. Uh, and it's a Ron Porphyry, and a Ron Porphyry, it's like a lava, it's like an igneous rock. Now, an igneous rock is one that is basically made from magma, from molten rock. And lava is molten rock that erupts on the surface. And in this particular case, what has happened is that some of the lava has crystallized out into crystals before the lava has been erupted. And you get this lava with crystals in it called a porphyry. This particular rock has crystals which are rom shaped and they like little like diamonds you can see one here they've got straight edges and this is um unusual because it's only found in three places in the world and only one place in europe and that is just outside oslo and i've been to the quarry and it's worked as a construction aggregate and it's pretty fascinating but how on earth did this piece of rom porphyry get to chroma. <laughs> and the theory goes is that during the ice ages, this Ron Porphyry was picked up. But what happens with the glacier, it freezes onto rock and plucks them out of the ground and then carries them long distances. And this then has worked its way to the east coast. And you will find 
Ron Porphyry, right along the East Coast, not just from Cromer, but going all the way north, up through Lincolnshire into Yorkshire. So there's a whole suite of this stuff. And you find a lot of rocks on this coastline which have come from glacial material. So what happened is the glaciers have picked up rocks from right across the country, from, from, from the Midlands, the North and Scotland, and then taken them to the coast. And you'll find a huge variety of different rock site types in places like Hornsey that I showed you earlier. The East Coast is a fascinating place for geology. You get a big variety of rocks. It's amazing. So this is one of the reasons why this is my favourite rock is not just because it's a perfect shape, it's because it's got a really intriguing story behind it as well. Now this one, this one is a type of limestone. Now limestone is a sedimentary rock made of the remains of um, shells and, and, and of the hard parts of animals basically. This particular case, this limestone is made of coral. Now coral obviously is a, is a, is a uh, grows uh, uh, in colonies. Uh, you might be thinking of the Great Barrier Reef or in the Caribbean, areas where there's shallow warm seas and you get lots of life and you get these corals and each of these little circles that you can see is the top of a tube and basically the coral has grown up, th up through and created this mass of rock called a coral, coral reef. So this is a fragment of a coral reef and this is really fascinating and I think you know as a, as a, a limestone um, if it's got a fossil in it you, you're pretty sure it's limestone. Um, you, can, you, can, you can do tests on limestones but I've got another piece of limestone I'll come to in a bit. <clears throat> Now this is really interesting, and um, I would say this is nice. <laughs> That's how you pron pronounce that word in the top left. It's got a silent G basically, but it's a nice piece of rock. <clears throat> this came from Scotland, and it's some of the old gneiss in Scotland. The Louisian gneiss is some of the oldest rock in the country. As a rule of thumb, in the UK, if you go from the southeast to the northwest, you're getting older. East to west, you're getting older. And some of the rocks in the, in, in, in the highlands are over a billion years old. It's staggering. And this would have started life probably as a sandstone. And you get different, different types of gneiss. Some gneiss are formed from granite. Other gneiss are formed from sedimentary rock. I suspect this one was probably a sandstone. Hence the layers. <clears throat> this is another igneous rock. <clears throat> and this one is a basalt. And the basalt is a, a volcanic rock, it's a lava. And the sort of rock that you might find, I don't know, on, on Iceland or in Hawaii. In this particular case, what's happened is, you know, lava has erupted and cools down quite quickly, which is why you don't generally get crystals in them. But, but, but igneous rock like lava has a lot of gas in it. And that gas normally bubbles away when the rock cools. But Sometimes those bubbles of gas aren't released quick enough before the rock stops, before the rock solidifies. So what happens is you get some bubbles of gas trapped in the rock and hence these little round um, patches on here. And they're basically what we call vesicles and vesicles are holes in an igneous rock caused by a bubble of gas. And over time, over geological time, what happens, minerals fill the holes and they're now called amygdales. So the vesicles are filled with minerals like calcite or zeolite or other minerals. And hence the term amygdaloidal basalt. It's a bit of a mouthful, but it's actually really nice. I really like this rock. Uh, and this one, I think this one came from the Yorkshire case as well. I haven't put the location on it. Oh, there we go, sandstone. <laughs> I hope, fairly obvious, Certainly in this type of rock, um, as I mentioned before, sandstone is made of sand. And in this, this particular type of sand, it could be the same sand as you find on a beach is formed into a rock, or it could be from a desert. And it's going to be mostly the mineral quartz, which is hard, but there will be other minerals potentially like feldspar and mica and iron and other minerals as well. And hence you might get a bit of coloration picking up the layers. And you can just faintly see layers in this rock and they're sedimentary layers. Um, and this is where the rock has been layered up and it's compressed and, and solidified into a, into a rock. And then generally what happens is 
you'll get something called cement, which is a bit like glue between the particles, sticking them together. Sometimes that glue is very weak and hence the rock will be really crumbly. Other times the cement is very strong and this will be a very tough rock and you can get extremely hard sandstones. Sometimes you, they don't feel sandy because the glue, the, the cement has basically made it into one mass of quartz. So a really nice rock. Oh, and one of my other favorite rocks, this is a phyllite. This is a metamorphic rock. Now, a metamorphic rock has, is, is a rock that has been formed by changing other rocks by either temperature or pressure. So the rock, so in this particular case, this started life as a mudstone. And that mudstone would have been squished and turned into a rock. That squishing and pressurizing continued. And then you get other rocks forming from mud, like shale and slate. And then slate, you know, for roof, roof slate. But if this pressure continues, what happens then? Some of the minerals in your, in, in your rock start to crystallize out. And you can see the dots. They're known as porphyroblasts, and they are minerals that have grown. But you can also see the surface very wavy. And this is basically called a crenulated, the cleavage of the rock with the pressure. And it's basically crenulated the surface of the rock. So it's a beautiful piece of rock. And I love this. I think this one came from Kintyre, actually. Ah, and, and I showed you that um, some maps from Aram earlier. And this is the piece of rock that I picked up from Whiting Bay from, from the beach there. And this is known as a quartz porphyry. And you can see it's a little bit like the, quartz, the, the, the rum porphyry I showed earlier. It's, a, it's a, a, a fine igneous rock, but it's got white, uh, what we call phenocrysts or feldspar, and also glassy gray, almost rounded crystals of quartz. And I think this is beautiful because they're sort of slightly clear uh, and amazing. This, this is, for me, a, a miracle, this, this piece of rock. And you do get intrusions, uh, I think it's a place called Drummadoon on the west coast of Arran, where you, this famous location for this, but this was on the east coast, so there must be other locations where the quartz, por quartz porphyry occurs as well, but to have occurred there, I suspect. So I, I was really chuffed when I found this piece of rock. Oh, this one came from Cromer again. And I was very jealous. One of my friends found this, so I borrowed it. <laughs> that was two years ago. And this is a piece of flint. And the flint has basically taken the ship. Basically, the flint has formed around something called an echinoid. Now, an echinoid is a sea urchin. And you, basically, this would have had spines and it would have been on the, would have been on the sea floor. And you get a lot of these um, flints in the chalk in, in southern England, southern and eastern England. And sometimes the, the flint material forms around fossils and you get these amazing fossils. So one day I'll find my own. I've not found my own yet, but this is pretty cool actually. Um, this one is a schist. And again, um, we, we were talking about mudstone earlier. This is formed from mud and the metamorphism has gone so far that the minerals are almost all totally recrystallized into mica. And this is beautiful. If you hold it up to the light, Basically, this will glitter. Can you see the glittering there? I should have been showing you the rocks at the same time. But that basically, that surface, it layers out. The mica is a very flat platy mineral. And it lay, when it's formed, it forms layers. So you get very, very flat pebbles with this. Fantastic. It's great for skimming. <laughs> and this is a gabbro. Uh, it's here somewhere. <laughs> a gabbro is another igneous rock. Remember, igneous rocks from magma but instead of being erupted at surface this magma has stayed underground and what happens with magma when it's cools very slowly underground is you get big crystals forming this one has a fairly basic composition which is low in silica there is no quartz in this but you get lots of things like feldspar and pyroxene and other sort of like darker minerals generally tends to be quite dark this one is fairly sort of like um, variegated This is, we mentioned chalk earlier, uh, doesn't look terribly white from this image. It's quite hard to take, like I said, take photos of, 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 rocks, of rocks generally to make them look like they are. But, but chalk is, a, is a, a limestone. It's 
and limestone, as I said earlier, is almost 100% made of the remains of, of shells and animals. In this particular case, this is made of micro fossils, tiny, tiny fossils called coccoliths, these little plates that rained down in the sea and formed a thick white ooze and then were compressed. This chalk covered a large part of Europe and you, you find chalk deposits in a large, in many, many places. <clears throat> and this is where also, if you look at the chalk, you'll see layers of flints. So you, that's where the echinoid came from. And hopefully a lot of you will recognize this. Granite, I think one of my favorite rocks again, it's another igneous rock, a little bit like gabbro, magma underground very slow very slow cooling which allows the crystals to grow and you can see you can see the gray crystals the sort of glassy gray crystals of quartz the sort of more whitish crystals are alkali feldspar and you've got pink uh, sorry a plagioclase feldspar the pinkish crystals are things like orthoclase and little specks of black that's biotype mica that's a classic combination quartz feldspar and mica and the, an interlocking crystals that, that makes granite such a good building material because it's very strong and you can often cut it in lots of different directions so you can make blocks and, and things out of it oh there you go that's all the pebbles i was obviously going to show you i mentioned this earlier um if you're interested um seek out the pebble spot in the facebook group um it's that's the the number of members so far and also if you're on to in, in twitter uh you can seek me out at clive bgs and use the hashtag uh pebble spotters katie i think that's there you go that's the last one oh that was awesome thank you so much and um, we've got some more questions so Good. i don't know if you want to start yeah, with yeah. these um let's go with that so We've got some that came in before and um, one was from George asking what is your most surprising pebble find i.e how did it possibly get there it's a really yeah. good question yeah I I that's interesting I, I think I think I, I've probably come back to my the rum porphyry that I found earlier I think I think it, it took me a a little bit of research to realize how unusual that was because when I discovered it I didn't particularly appreciate how unique it was um, so the rum porphyry, I think, is the is the one. But but the other thing that surprises me about that is it's, it's actually it's not that rare. If you go up the coast, you will you will find some. If you look hard enough, you will find it. There's lots of it. So a lot of it came over from Norway. <laughs> so in this, in the Nor the Oslo was obviously uh, a lot of the rocks were taken away. There's still plenty there in Norway, but uh, but obviously that for me that was quite probably. Probably the most surprising one for me, I would say. I would say. That's cool because you do find a lot of that up on the Angus coast in Scotland. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Particularly around sort of Ochmethy and Lunan Bay area. Wow, I didn't, so it's gone even further north, blimey. <laughs> yeah. And we have uh, what's the next one here. Uh, well, Kevin asked, what was your favourite pebble spotting beach area in Scotland? And we have sent the posted the link in the chat to the beach events that are happening over the festival. But do you have any recommendations at all? Yeah, um, that's a good question. I, I think the, be the, the beach that I mentioned on Aaron, I didn't have enough time, I think. You know, I, I have, what happens with me often when I'm ho on holiday, Pebble hunting is fitted in to gaps between when when um, I've got 10 minutes and then on Whiting Bay, it was one of those situations where I just thought, oh, I've got 10 minutes, I'll have a quick look. Oh my God, look at this, what have I found? <laughs> Amazing. So that for me was was a was a, an opener. Aaron has a, a wide diverse geology as well. I think you get a lot of different rocks there. And it's within easy, with easy distance, easy striking distance from the, from the mainland as well. So you get the, the, the Kalmak ferry over. Um, so yeah, that's probably, but other beaches uh, on Kintyre, this just a big long stretch of coast there. That was pretty amazing. Um, Craig Nair as well. Uh, I can't remember, is that more? I think it was another another ferry terminal somewhere, <laughs> probably where I was waiting. Um, and, and the other thing as well is not, like I said before, on rivers, um, I, um, I stayed in Newton Moor and um the river there and i can't remember is that the spay um the river that goes through newton moor for me these were a bit more um 
rivers which were just full of, of geology that I don't see uh, normally. A lot of old rocks, a lot of a lot of metamorphic rocks, a lot of gneiss and schist and and things that I don't find very often. So for me, that was another great place. Um, and there's lots of spots along along that stretch on, on the river as well, where you've got little islands and banks and sand and beaches. Fantastic. So I suspect I'll probably there are probably other places, but that, that'll do for now, maybe. Thank you. Yeah, there's some really, really great places around Scotland. Um, and I think one of my favourite things about Pebble Beaches is the diversity of stuff you can find. It's always really exciting. Um, got some more questions for you now. Uh, one from Joanna asking if the drawings under the stones are your own drawings and do you always draw them and does that help you understand their makeup? Do you mean under I, like that, for example? So I'm showing so that the pictures here, can you still see that, Katie? Yeah. 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 So those are actually the illustrations from the book. So what I did basically, I was sent, I was sent some of the illustrations from the book. So they're not my illustrations. They they're the artist who who um, so no Ella Siena and Ella. Uh, you, if you look for Ella, uh, she's mostly on Instagram. So if you look for Ella Siena, she basically I sent Ella forty pebbles. Well, I sent the pebbles to the publisher. The publisher sent Ella the um, so for example. Let's have a look. So Philite. Um, here we go. So there we go. That's the illustration in the book. So that is what you're looking at here. So it's I, I, I thought I don't want to put up her pictures on Instagram or Twitter or whatever I'm doing. So I just I just obscure them slightly <laughs> with my, my own picture. And I just did it as a counterpoint, really, just to show. Um, and for, I, I, I would not have any artistry in drawing things. For taking pictures, I'm quite pleased with the pictures. I bought a little mobile, uh, small portable uh, light box to take these to pictures in. Really hard to get good pictures, like I, I keep saying, but um, I'm pleased with these ones. Awesome. And next question. Sorry, I'm bombarding you here. No, but no, keep going. I'm loving it. <laughs> really, really good chat. Um, Jodie is asking, what causes the magnetic properties in the gabbro in the Cullen? Oh, what causes the magnetic properties in it? it it's going to be um, uh, particular minerals that occur in the gabbro. So there will be iron bearing minerals and you get different types of iron minerals. Uh, the classic ones for magnetism are things like magnetite and it's an iron oxide. You do get other minerals which which have iron in them uh, and you get different stuff types of magnet magnetism um, and what normally happens it's interesting because uh, you can you can look at sort of past direction of of magnetic fields by studying the magnetism and the, the magnetic direction of, of frozen in the rocks because basically when a magnet, an English rock is, is formed and solidifies, any, any mineral, magnetic minerals in there will align with the magnetic field. And then you can calculate going back in time, as long as the rock's still in place. So, uh, but yeah, it's gonna be iron. Iron is the, is the key really to magnetism. Thank you. And why did the publishers restrict you to 40 pebbles? Yes, I argued for a hundred. No, I didn't. <laughs> um, I that's a very good question. Um, if they'd have said sixty, I I, I think I would have had to have been in more than one extra beat. I would have been going to a lot more beaches. Um, I I think it was a fairly random thing. Um, I think basically they just calculated the number of pages and then just said, right, we can we can accommodate forty pebbles, um, and. Because what they what, what when they when well, I was commissioned, okay. Well, BGS was commissioned. I I did the work, um, and they wanted an introduction, forty pebbles, and a hundred words a pebble, which sounds like a lot. It's not a lot. I in fact I argued for one hundred fifty words. There can't there can't be many authors that have argued for a fifty percent increase in the amount they've got to write, and I also wrote a glossary, and also we did some little features. Uh, so I did a lot more, but I'm really pleased. 
And also, if there's less pebbles in this one, that means there's more space for pebbles for the next book. <laughs> Who knows? <Good> <laughs> And there's a question from Terry asking, are some pebbles from ships ballast? Um, which I can say a wee bit about that from the first of fourth. Um, yeah. I don't know if you've got experience of that down in England. I, I, I mean, not direct experience, but so many times we see uh, stuff online and you get a lot of uh, artificial material like slag that have been used to fill ballast. So slag is a sort of byproduct from metal refining and smelting. And you'll often get find that sort of stuff. It's it's hard to identify. Uh, it can look a bit glassy, but but yeah, I don't have any direct case. Go on, you go, Katie. Yeah, I was just going to say because the Firth of Fourth has always had a very strong industrial heritage, and you had a lot of ships uh, ships coming in. You see a lot of ship ballast, particularly a lot of flint around the area where I live, because there's old historic lime kilns. So the boats would come in and drop their ballast and then pick up the quick lime that they'd be transporting away. So it's made for a really, really interesting array of geology there. Um, so it is something that can happen, but you never know where that ship ballast has come from or if that's then being transported again. But that's a really good question because sometimes you you never really know if it's been there because of a, a sort of human process that's led to it being there. Now, we've also been asked if the photos of the pebbles are also available online anywhere. Hmm, good question. Yes. Do you know what? I uploaded them to, if you go on the Amazon page for the book and there's a bit for the author, I got a feeling I put the photos in there. Uh, and also, I'm pretty sure if you go, uh, on Instagram and find my Instagram account. I think I put them on my Instagram as well. Um, I'm not a great Instagram user. <laughs> so, but if you look for Clive Mitchell on Instagram, you will find, you should find them there. I'm pretty sure I put them all on there. And I'm sure I, I, I've tweeted them many times and, and probably put them on Facebook as well. But I suspect because I don't use Instagram very often, there aren't that many photos. So you'll find them on there, I think. Awesome, thank you. Now, I think that's most of the questions in the chat. So if you want, I can share my screen and yes. show some of the pebble photos that have been sent. There you go, I'll stop sharing. Oh. Uh -huh. Can everybody see that okay? Yep, yeah, got it. Awesome. So this is the first one that I've got here, which is a pebble from Rose Market in the Moray Firth, which was found by Barbara. Now, it's interesting, you know, because I when when Katie shared this, um, uh, I think it was yesterday, and I had a quick look. And actually, if you're on your computer, you can you can go. Um, there's a web on the British Geological Survey website that there, there's something called the Geology of Britain viewer. The Geology of Britain viewer is um, the same data that you get on the app, but you can see it on your computer. And you can you can basically just go around the country and I just whiz to Rosemarkey and you can see a lot of metamorphic geology of nice and other really old rocks in the area. And what we're looking at here, and I think Katie agreed, it was it was um, mostly a lump of quartz and, 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 and other minerals that have basically been transformed by metamorphism. So this would possibly would have been a sedimentary rock in the past before it was as its sort of precursor rock, but this has been transformed into 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 nice by the look of it. Yeah, it's got a really beautiful sort of te like surface texture to it as mm. well. Yes, it does. You're right. Yes. And the next ones we have are some pebbles from beaches in southwest Scotland, which were found by Claire. Mm -hmm. There's mm -hmm. some interesting ones here. That's interesting because these look sedimentary to me. And we've got the ones on the left that they look a bit like maybe fine silts, fine sandstone or siltstone with some veins, possibly veins of quartz running through them. But the one that's the sort of third one from the left, it's got a very flat, very flat surface. This looks like it's been shattered, ice shattered. So it cost, possibly is come from a glacial um, um, deposit, potentially, because you do see these uh, shattered pebbles uh, down, down here as well in the Midlands. Um, you get certain types of rock that basically 
they, they just break in half when they're frozen, I think. That third one's very interesting because I can't quite tell mm. what's going on with the, the surface. This is what I, yeah, this is what I'm saying, Katie. I think this is the one that's been shattered. You, you do get you do get this where they break apart. Yeah. So I've got some way you, you come across a round pebble, it's completely broken in half cleanly. Um, and that one on the end, that about the fourth one, um, we weren't sure, maybe a quartz. <laughs> something like that yeah i would say maybe quartz but we have some methods that you can use you can sort of usually do with stuff you have in your kitchen that you can do a quick test which involves if you have a sort of steel knife if you can try and scratch it if it scratches it means it's softer than the knife and it's probably a calcite and to confirm that more if you have some vinegar in your house you can drop few bits of vinegar onto the rock and it will fizz if there's calcium carbonate in there. Yeah, good test. <laughs> and the next one, it was found in Orkney by Joanna. This yeah. is a really beautiful one. This is lovely, yeah. Again, this looks like uh, a laminated sedimentary rock to me. Um, and I think, uh, Katie, you suggested it might be Caithness flagstone maybe or something like that, is that right? Or from somewhere in that sort of formation okay. yeah, where you get yeah, yeah. sort of the fine grained laminated stuff. And yeah, yeah. I think the way it's been weathered and eroded has made it just this beautiful patternation. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this would have been layers basically of rock and, the, and, and it's just for, the, the pebble is formed and brought out the layers. Really nice. Awesome. I'm just going to stop sharing just now so that I can have a look in the chat to see if we have any more questions. I think I noticed some popping up. Yep. Um, we have one from Catherine asking, why do you get veins of quartz? What's the mechanism that caused it to form? That's a really good question. You yeah. do see that a lot. Yeah, you do. Yeah. And what normally happens is um, when rocks are formed, uh, you'll often get fractures and cracks through the rock. And sometimes you get hot fluids and other fluids that, that have minerals in them. And the fluids will then travel through the cracks and they deposit those minerals along the cracks. And this is why you get veins. So, you know, you'll often see that. And sometimes you get cross cutting cracks. So you might see veins crossing other veins. So this is the normal way, I think. And sometimes those veins, those veins can be mineralized. You might get, uh, if it's quartz, gold associates with quartz. So you get or, or most likely pyrite, iron pyrites. Uh, and other minerals. So sometimes, you know, you do get interesting minerals associating with, with, with veins. Thank you. We also have one from Pamela asking, what tips do you have for spotting agate? Um, for that, first of all, I would suggest make sure you're sort of looking in areas where you're likely to find the agate. And um, there's quite a lot of information online about different beaches that are likely to have sort of agate on the beach. Um, but one of the things I look for is the surface normally has quite a pitted texture and it looks almost waxy in a way and does just kind of stand out from the other rocks that you see. But I don't know if you have any advice, Clive, on... No, it's not something that I've ever really come across, to be honest. I mean, that's that's really interesting. Um, maybe I've ignored them. Maybe I... I sh and like I said before, I generally tend not to use my hammer very often, so I tend to go for things. So sometimes breaking the rock open can reveal... The really interesting stuff so no that's good that was that was interesting Katie thank you well sometimes with agates you can actually see some of the banding from mm. the outside so quite often when you look at it you yeah, can yeah. see that there is a bit of a pattern but sometimes you don't always know until you cut the rock open so yeah, it's yeah. always a big surprise whether it's going to be <laughs> yeah. nice or not inside <laughs> fantastic I think that is all the questions unless anybody else has any more and wants to pop them into the chat. Um, lots of very good feedback, though everyone's really enjoyed it. No, 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 thank you. Thank you everyone for, for coming along. And just a wee reminder to everyone as well that there is a lot of beach pebble events happening across Scotland over the festival. So check out the Scottish Geology Trust website and have a look and see if there's any happening near you. Cool. No, no, thank you, James. Thank you, everyone. Um, I should have been looking at the talk. No, fantastic.
Yeah. No, thank I, you. I, I, thank I, I, you. No, no, my pleasure. Thank you. Um, it, it's. Uh, I am a professional geologist, but I'm also. Um, it's, it's my hobby. It's my enthusiasm. <laughs> it's everything, really. So, I enjoy doing this definitely. Um,